prepare? How does that kind of relate to that? And what I would say is that um, <coughs> it relates to it in that they took the time to sit down for however, I'm not sure how long they took, they sat down and they kind of thrashed out how do we want to present ourselves in the market? What do we want people to say when they're discussing our product, us? And I think that ultimately that is a very worthwhile uh, exercise for any graduate, soon to be graduate, looking to enter the workplace. So that's probably one of the most clumsier segues you're going to hear. But um, the business place involves one skill. It all boils down to selling. If you can't sell, you have no place in the room. If you're not selling, then you're buying. If you're buying, you're giving someone your money. And that's not business, that's buying. Right? So the skill, of the, the skill of business is the skill of selling. The art of business is the art of selling. And, <coughs> and, and it's a really important thing to consider because it will affect everything that you do on an individual and corporate level as soon as you leave you, you know, academia. You know, as soon as you go out into the world of business, some of you will have already may have come from the world of business. In which case, you're probably you're well aware of this. Even as a student, even as a, an artist, as a, as someone who wants to go off and, and 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 use their the things that they create, you know, to, you need to sell it. You can't just turn up to someone and say, "Listen, here it is. This is cool, isn't it?" You know, they say, "Well, yeah, it's all right, but look at that." You need to sell yourself. You need to sell your assets. You need to sell what you do to ensure, if we're talking about you know, the workplace, to ensure that you are remunerated as well as possible for your efforts, right? Because it's the bottom line, it's business. I'm gonna make an assumption, not an assumption, but I'll just ask you to kind of go with me on this, which is that we would probably all agree that if someone applies for a job and he's got skill set here, and some other guy what comes up to the job, you know, applies for the same job, and his skill set is here. Then we probably agree, you know, maybe the employer would be kind of crazy not to hire this guy, right? He would, you know, he'd look at this guy and say, "Oh well, I'm sure you're a good guy, but you know, this guy is, you know." How do you get around that? Because, as I learned, as you may go on to learn, I don't know, maybe you're 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 the one percent. You're never the best in the room. There will always be, and you know, depending on the size of the room, you know, we could be talking about the industry at large. You're never going to be, unless you are, in which case, fair play to you. You're never going to be the best graphic designer. You're never going to be the best copywriter. You're never going to be the best, you know, you're never going to make the best website. You know, there is always likely to be someone who's got maybe a little edge on you, who can do a little bit better, who maybe just fits the client's brief a little bit better. It may have been nothing to do with skill set, it may be to do with just sheer personality. So, how do you overcome that? Um, you know, loads of grads, few jobs. This is the thing that no one tells you about universities, it's the thing that nobody kind of told me. <clears throat> universities are fantastic, I think you'd agree, Godfrey. They're fantastic at doing what they do, they're fantastic at creating graduates. They're, they're oh, fantastic, here are your skill sets, off you go. What you forget is that universities are a business, you're all paying fees. You know, next year, you know, they're not just going to close up after you guys graduate and say, well, we did well there, let's kind of call it a day. Pats on the back, high fives all around, right? Next year, London College of Communication is going to spend a lot of time making sure that there is a room of individuals just like you who are going to leave the room with the skills, same skill set that you guys have. And you can be equally sure that this time last year, there was a room full of people who, who were on the same journey that you were on, who were now maybe looking over their shoulder. I'm sure. You know, who are these guys? What kind of skills are they going to have? And what I'm coming around to, and what I'm trying to get to, is that in order to figure out what sets you apart from the crowd, you're always going to be in a crowd. You're always going to, I'm a graphic designer, so are all we. I'm a media designer, I make websites, well, so do we. What sets you apart? What sets you apart is the same thing that sets first derivative apart, is the brand identity, your personal brand. And I would argue that it will require the same amount of thought in the same amount of consideration that went into that video that you've just seen in order for you to kind of walk into an interview 
and have a full idea, a fully formed idea of how you want to present yourself. <coughs> you might be asking yourself, what do employers look for? I have no idea. I'm not an employer. I'm an employee. I can tell you that when I, uh, when I started the work I'm doing at the moment, the work that the, the chair I'm currently sitting in used to be called the hot chair because no one lasted in more than about six weeks. I've been there five months, and hopefully the fact that I'm standing here presenting in front of you guys would indicate this kind of going reasonably well. They don't mind kind of sending me out and, uh, and talking to you guys. But why have I fitted in? Why, why has it gone well for me? I would argue that it's because my personal brand matches the brand identity of the company that I work for. The skill set is going to be the same. If you're looking for a copywriter, you're looking for someone who can read, write, who can dot the I's and cross the T's or vice versa. Um, and you know, and who knows his way around a, a set of punctuation. So if the skill set is the same, then how does one person succeed in the business space when another one doesn't? I would say it's the, um, the personal <coughs> brand. Um, you know, what, what, what can I expect from the workplace? Well, again, I don't know. I can tell you what to expect from my workplace. Workplaces change, they vary. But, what, but you should be very clear on the fact that what, uh, what the workplace is like will affect you. And it may well be that your personal brand and the brand identity of the company that you go on to work for may not be compatible. Um, you know, you could be very happy going off and sitting down in a corporate job, you know, sitting down at your desk, shirt and tie, you've got your pad in front of you and you spend the day, you know, designing. That could be quite happy and in that case more power to you. Equally, it could be that you've got this um, need to be kind of surrounded by vibrant creativity. You need to have music pumping all day. You need to have people kind of come, oh, look at this, this is great. You might need more energy in your workplace, more power to you. But if someone who's suited to work in place A tries and gets a job in place B, that's really not going to work, is it? If the bland corporate dude turns up and says, yes, because if we turn the music down, we're going to be laughed at. In the same way as if you turn up in a work environment, where, you know, and it's covered in, I don't know, loud clothing, whatever, everyone else is wearing gray suits and fully beige, then that's not going to work either. Um, I would say this in terms of selling yourself, and this is just, there are certain prerequisites, not prerequisites, that's the wrong word, it makes it sound like I'm laying down the law. What I would say, from a personal point of view, it's very important, regardless of your brand identity, regardless of how you intend to market yourself as a potential employee, there are some key things that you need to um, just try to ensure that run through your work. The first is, and I actually didn't write these down, so they're not on the PowerPoint, because um, I'm that prepared. Uh, you, need to, um, you need to be proud of your work. You need to be engaged with your work. Your work needs to mean something to you. If it doesn't, then you're going to do a really sloppy job. But you're not an artist if you go on to work in the creative industry. You're not an auteur. If someone turns around to me and says, sorry, that work you did is wrong. I can't say, how dare you? The alliteration was magnificent. You know, the, 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 it flows itself in a wonderful narrative arc. And it's what, you know, they say, sorry, that's not what we're looking for. I can throw a hissy fit, but I'm damn sure I'm going to be out of the job at the end of the week. So you need to be engaged in your work without being owned by it or overly invested in it might be a better uh, turn of phrase. So that'd be the first thing. Second thing I would say is that work again, all workplaces have ident have um, have brand identities, have have their own atmospheres. Um, you need to be fully aware of what you're getting in for, what you're going in for. Um, I have one friend, two acquaintances. Uh, one of them works, two of them work for Google, one of them works for Facebook in Ireland. Um, and they both, all of them are, everyone, you know, getting into Google, getting into Facebook, it's this massive thing. It's going to be amazing. There's going to be bouncy castles and chocolate for lunch. It's going to be, you know, snooze pods. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to play video games all day. And it's true. All of that is there. And it's fantastic. What people don't tell you, Google and Facebook have, they have no problem filling roles. But I would argue that they have a bit of an issue retaining people. Because not everyone is built to operate 
in a free flow work environment. Not everyone is built to kind of say, oh listen, can you get this done by Monday? Yeah, cool, I'm just gonna jump in the hot tub. <laughs> and then Monday comes around and kind of say, okay, so did we get that done? Oh, uh, I think we kind of brainstormed a bit between like lunch and you know, and you know, the work doesn't get done. And all of a sudden, you know, like, oh yeah, Facebook was really fun, I really had a great time, but I've been unemployed for two months and I can't, you know. It does not, you know, do you see the point I'm trying to make? You know, uh, all all works will, all workplaces will have their own atmospheres, and you need to be, you know, in terms of kind of selling yourself as a graduate, you need to be, you know, nod your head up in terms of where you might be looking to, to, to work. You know, in terms of a, of a potential interview, it's definitely a question you need to ask. What's your workplace like? You know, I kind of walk, you know, because no one is ever going to interview in the heart of their workplace. In fact, it's going to be a meeting room kind of off the side. Like, what's it like day to day? The third thing I would say. Um, and this, I'm a, you know, this is kind of the, the Vinny corner hour where I kind of give off my advice. The rest of it is all just insight. This is this is the advice bit. Um, own your personal brand. Own it. Figure out what it is. Embrace it because it's only going to make you a better artist. It's going to make you better at what you do. It's going to make the work that you produce better if you can embrace it and own what you do. For you designers, I'm sure it's probably a bit easier than the work for the wordsmiths because you've probably already done some work towards identifying, you know, what's your style, what, you know, what's your, you know, I don't know, maybe you haven't. But, so own your personal brand, absolutely. Don't be upset if it's not appealing to somebody. Don't be, you know, you can't walk around and be like, oh, I'm fantastic, I've got all this, you know, so like, oh yeah, cool, that's, that's fine, but we're looking for something else. Your personal brand is fantastic and, you know, more power to you, but you want to have the music up on 11 and have, you know, acid house pumping out the speakers all day and you know this is a Starbucks you know so in terms of selling yourself as a graduate absolutely you know personal brand very important remember that you know it's what it is what's going to set you apart from your contemporaries and from your peers who have the same skill set as you but those three things as um, you know don't be owned by your work know what you're getting in for and um, What's the third one? <laughs> your personal brand. Yes. You should get up here and finish me off. <laughs> well, sorry, it's a really cool <laughs> I write for a living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you want to just take a minute there? To sit down? <laughs> so, with all that being said, where does an LCC grad fit into the workplace? Where, where, is, where do you go from here? Where do you go from, so it's October. It's October, it is October. It's October, so you guys are finishing around kind of May? Yes, yeah, so you've got a couple of months. <laughs> Who here has done internships? Show of hands. I'm sure we all have, quite a few of us. Um, you know, you, you've, got your, you've got, some of you have already taken those kind of steps towards you know, getting feet in, in, the, in the doorway and stuff. Where does the LCC grad fit in? I would, before I kind of go in, you know, not go into that, before I kind of offer my thoughts on that, I want to show you one last video, uh, and then, because I've been talking for far too long, uh, we will wrap up, okay? So, take a look at this. The global markets are a noisy place. Finding harmony isn't easy. Complex problems need effective solutions creating greater efficiency and reducing costs, increasing access to markets and staying ahead of regulation, seizing opportunities for safe, secure growth. It's the difference between making people listen and making them move. Triana provides critical market-wide pre- and post-trade infrastructure, proven innovation that provides connectivity, streamlining and reduces risk helping the world's most demanding financial institutions find the harmony they need. Triana, in the middle of the markets, at the heart of innovation. Triana are another one of these trade processing entities. They're another one of these propeller head engineer, finance, hard-nosed bunch of dudes, right? They came to us and said, we want to make a video. We said, that's fine, we can make a video. 
and we went away and we brainstormed it a little bit and we said, your product is, you know, the product is called Harmony, Triana Harmony. And I said, there's something here, there's something in this. We can get, you know, harmony in the markets, harmony in the marketplace, you know, drawing all the threads together musically. And they kind of looked at us like we had 10 heads. What? We're, tr we're we process trades. We're talking about getting four dudes in red jackets to walk through London with instruments. What the hell are you talking about? It's bonkers. <laughs> However, they trusted us. They embraced this, I you know, this brand that maybe wasn't um, what they had would have thought themselves. But the more they kind of played around with it, the more they sat around and kind of rolled the flavor around in their mouth a little bit, they kind of said, okay, yeah, no, let's, let's give it a shot. And they embraced it and they went for it wholeheartedly. Bottom line, because again, we're all talking about the creative industry, we're talking about business. Revenue is up. They've got this brand new brand identity that everybody loves, that no one else is doing. Importantly, how do you set yourself out from the crowd? And they're doing, they're doing great work. They've just finished a, a, a conference in Lisbon. They've got all sorts of crazy sales pieces in the next couple of weeks. And everyone, the, the feedback that they're getting and that they're feeding through to us is that people are kind of saying, wow, why haven't we done something like that? So I'm going to finish here. I'm going to wrap here. Next steps, where to go from here? I would argue that there is a lesson to be learned from Triana's bravery in terms of embracing and wholeheartedly committing oneself to a personal brand that is considered and that is authentic, but that can represent you in as, in as positive a light as possible. And I would argue that if you do that, and if you dive in, and if you give it, you know, an honest shot, you know, I was, without wanting to sound corny or, or whatever, I'd say the world is your oyster, you know, there are a hundred other uh, tired old cliches. Um, but yeah, success is just around the corner. If you embrace, I would say, if you embrace your personal brand with bravery and authenticity, then success is yours. So that's it. That's all I've got. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yeah. So... That idea, you said there's 10 people in your workplace. Yes, small workplace. So, have you got is it one person who's in control of like, videos and stuff like that? Because obviously you're trying to work out that you're one, you're sort of written side of it. Mm. So that's one down, there's nine to produce something like that. I mean, how big was that team? Because the graphics, yeah, that's one person, probably. Um, so, so that you're talking about that brass band video. Um, how do we do that? So we are, we, are, we are a small outfit, right? And that means we have, in the film and video department, we have two people. We've got a director, slash the head of the department, and we've got um, kind of head of video production. Her name's Poppy. Um, production in terms of lighting up cameras, organizing, getting clearances, getting all this kind of stuff. For things like, you know, getting a DOP in, for kind of getting you know, sound guys in. Th that's all uh, third party. That's all hired in hired for in. the day. And that's all factored into the budget that we would project, uh, present to the client in and terms so of how much the video is going to cost. Did all the post production? Post production we do in house. Done by our head of, our head <coughs> of video, director. Direct. He's, he's got a heavy plate. He's got a big plate. And there's a lot of stuff on. Uh, he's always busy. Because, uh, as I said, video is the new selling tool. So, pretty much. Well, the large majority of, of engagements that we take on involve some sort of video work. In terms of getting the, the individual assets, getting the film, capturing the images, uh, we do, um, you know, as I say, it's, it's third party sourced. Post production, editing, all that kind of stuff, getting the final cut together is done in house. And it would be the same for all of those videos, with the exception of the. Like the first two were kind of fully in-house and mainly kind of infographic, so that's obviously a lot easier. But, um, but in terms of the brass band video and the bike video, which would both kind of happen out, outside of and then kind of require real-world capture, that's how we would um, manage it. So what are the other seven roles in the 
Uh, so from the top down, uh, well, no, actually, from, well, yeah, from top down, we've got a creative director through whom everything goes. He is, he's the guy who founded the company. Um, he's got final uh, clearance on everything. Then there is a production team um, who ensure that everything is uh, that happens on everything happens on schedule and everything is done. Then you've got there's a team of two, myself and, and one other in editorial. There is t uh, two in uh, they kind of sh share a kind of design and web design uh, brief. So kind of website creation and also you know creation of you know design assets. Um, so that's one. Uh, and then they're um, they kind of uh, uh, sorry, I'm doing a very poor job explaining this. Creative director, head of production, head of uh, director of visuals, right? Under him, the, um, or kind of alongside and around him, is the head of the film and video, of which there are two. The two kind of the designer and web design, so he's kind of got a, that there's five on that side of the house. Then there's myself and one other in editorial. Um, and then we have, as a company, we have quite an active kind of cultural um, footprint. Um, we have our own uh, radio station, we have our own record label, and we have our own, uh, we do kind of cultural events once a month, uh, which we call campfires. Uh, and they are all run by uh, Patty, who is our cultural ambassador, fantastico. Uh, she kind of puts, she puts everything together. Every, every, she, every, there's, there's a huge side of the business that isn't hard-nosed business and that Patty does all of that. She does, I, don't, I don't know how she fits it all into, into the working day. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how the, the land lies in terms of individual roles. I've got a couple of questions. Yeah. First, do you still do internship? Yes. And secondly, um, from the presentation, do you still see a future for print media? Because it seems to be you're saying to me that this global asset we have, the internet, the world wide web, we're doing things morally, uh, mainly by this medium as the preferred medium as opposed to print. Would that be correct? Print's a funny thing. Uh, advertising, marketing, communications, persuasion, persuading people to buy your stuff. Uh, you know, in terms of editorially, it's, it's hugely important. Because if you're not describing your product right, if you're not describing your company right, if you're using the wrong words, then no one's going to want it. No matter how well you identify your demographic and how well you tailor your delivery system to make sure that it gets into the hands of these people, uh, it's not going to work. It's not going to grab their attention. It's not. Nothing's going to come of it. So editorial is, is very important. I would. What I would say, the, the kind of traditional print. Um, the traditional print uh, places that you might find a print uh, are things like newspapers, magazines, uh, are certainly less important than maybe they would have been 10 or 15 years ago. But it's also possible, um, I mean, we, we, I would imagine it's quite difficult. I'm really not answering this question very well at all. I would imagine. For other creative agencies who specialize in B2C, business to the consumer, doing a kind of people are trying to sell you Pantene shampoo, I would imagine that it's quite a it's still quite a relevant uh, thing because anyone can pick up a newspaper and go, oh yeah, my hair is a mess. I'll get me some Pantene shampoo. But for what we do, which is specifically B2B, it's business to business. We're not trying to get. You know, we're not we're not we're not appealing to the guy who kind of spends his day. He's like, oh yeah, maybe we should use Triana to process our trades because he has no pull. We're trying to appeal to uh, CFOs, chief financial officers, people who have budget, people who can kind of say who, who have the power to say yes, let's pull the trigger on this and install it across our our, our, our uh, across our network across our company. And so to, to, to answer your question, in terms of print, it's, it, it's actually maybe a little bit easier because it's easier to identify the publications um, that these people might be, uh, you know, will be kind of reading on a regular basis. 
and it's not always to do with print. Um, you know, things like the FT, the Financial Times, um, is all it's fully digital now. You can get it on, online. Uh, a lot of these people are reading industry blogs, you know, so we can get banner ads and, and advertising in there. So in terms of in terms of is print advertising dead? I would say no, because advertise you know the kind of the adverts that you would traditionally see in pet newspapers, the little kind of square, you know, banner ads and, and, and stuff like that, are still a viable source of advertising. I would say that we're no longer placing them anymore in, you know, your broadsheets. We're going for on you know digital uh, digitized newspapers. We're going for industry uh, circulations. We're going for newsletters. We're going for blogs. Um, that kind of. There's actually quite an, um, one of our clients uh, was walking us through some work they did for a ferry company who were trying to um, they were trying to uh, focus in. They ran ferries from Poland to London. And they isolated a demographic. They were saying, well, there, is, there are people moving from Poland to London who are using the ferry. Why aren't they using our ferry? We need to kind of get. And the solution was quite elegant. They, went, uh, they isolated the ISPs of people who were reading Polish, news, Polish language newspapers with British ISP, ISP addresses. The idea being, you know, you're going to be a Polish speaker in, in, in England. So it was. It was quite targeted, but the ad that they ended up uh, getting to them would, you know, be quite a you know, quite a normal editorially kind of, you know, do you see what I'm saying? It's 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 the the, the, ad, the advertising is the same. The delivery system is much more sophisticated. I should have started with that. <laughs> 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 so Ten minutes. So that's, that's out of that's the second thing. question. Answer. So what about the first question? Internship. Internships. How yeah. Go about it? Say, for instance, with these guys would like. I would say um, if you would like to come and do an internship with us, um, the best thing to do would be to. Um, I mean, I don't want to create work for you, but if you could get in touch with Godfrey and then if you could send it on to us, I don't actually have. Um, I know we do have a, an email address. I mean, I could give you a very vague one, but I can't guarantee when it'll be picked up on. Um, so if you could get in touch with, with you, Godfrey, yeah, sure. and then if you could get a list together of people who might be interested, and then forward them on, to, if you could get in touch with Mike, yeah, yeah, would probably be the best way to do it in terms of kind of making sure that we take action on it instead of you guys sending emails and kind of like, oh, we haven't ever after you, you guys are love anymore. Might be the best way to do it. Yeah. Cool. And one of the things, the campfire stuff, you should go to it. Totally. It's really fun. Uh, so today is Thursday. So today week. The 17th, uh, the third Thursday of every week, yeah. we run this campfire, this cultural thing, um, this cultural thing. Uh, we get in like talkers in and they just kind of talk. This, last week we had a guy called Don Letts. I don't know if any of you are on uh, BBC Six or have any interest in the punk movement of the 70s, but Don Letts was this massive figure in, mu in the musical kind of cauldron of the 70s um, and a documentary. It was hugely interesting dude. He came in and talked to us. This Thursday coming, we've got a guy called Adam Smith. <coughs> Um, who is a di director. He's done loads of directing, loads of music videos uh, for the likes of the streets. He's done Chemical Brothers. Uh, Chemical Brothers, he did all the lighting um, for their live show, Don't Think. And he also made the documentary chronicling that tour. And, but his the big thing, he's, big in, he's massive in television. Um, and his big draw is that he, Matt Smith, the last Doctor Who, with the, his first season as Doctor Who, Adam Smith was 